So let me just start now. Day one. My mother sits on the couch waiting for me, done up like a little doll in one of her brightly colored cotton dresses. This one is pink and tangerine. Her face is jaundiced, her skin is jaundiced, and her face is strained and beaky with the effort of remaining upright. Dear one, she says, beaming warmly, creasing her worn skin, how did you know I'd need you? How did I know? Because I've always known what my mother's needs are and because Lydia Rentis had called me in New York City the day before and insinuated that my mother was beginning to die. Tu mami no esta comiendo casi nadita, Lydia said in her low, muffled, nasal tone that I've learned to understand over the past month of our telephone calls. My difficulty in comprehending her is not because we converse in Spanish to keep our discussions from my mother. I'm fluent in Puerto Rican Spanish but because Lydia has a badly mended hair lip that distorts her words. This afternoon, Lydia sits in the chair by the telephone. The wall behind her is an orangey gold, a few shades more muted than Lydia's own carrot bleached hair. And the wall behind my mother is green. Those two bright fields of color come together at the corner by the window where my mother always sits to talk with me. Those phone calls when I can hear the bell-like serenade of coquilles in the background. Coquille, the ebullient frogs sing as we labor through our conversations. My mother has painted these walls. My mother has painted the walls of every apartment or house we've ever rented in whatever city, town, or village we happen to have settled in. Each summer when she got off from teaching high school, she would say, I think it's time to start and we'd go out to the hardware store and buy the necessary gallons. In the early days, we used oil-based paint, and the house stank for a week, even though we'd leave the windows open. Before beginning, she'd slip her slender body into dungarees and an old shirt of my father's, the collar of which she'd turned one too many times. She'd tie a bandana around her curly black hair, secure paper bags over her shoes, and smear a skin of Vaseline on her glasses. Paint makes all the difference, she opined in the stillness of those humid afternoons as we swished the wide brushes and later the modern rollers down one wall after another. It conceals a multitude of sins. My mother is dying in Levittown Lakes, Puerto Rico, an urbanización near Catano, the town where one gets the ferry to go across the bay to old San Juan. Her little house, a flat roof, boxy structure, white with a hot pink front door, is on a cul-de-sac of other modest pastel cement block bungalows. My mother's street is Calle Maruja, the number AE5. Everyone but my mother and the Haitian family across the street is Puerto Rican. The pink door is open now as I stand in her living room, and the tropical sun bakes my back. Life goes on behind me. Joey Rios, who picked me up from the airport in my mother's car, he is Lydia's druggy boyfriend, straddles our front fence, sitting there waiting to see if he will be needed. Salsa music pulses loudly from next door. Children ride their bicycles up and down the sidewalk before our house, seeking to find out why the senora's daughter has come again. Lydia watches me with a host of emotions in her pinched expression proprietary protectiveness of my mother, concern for me and for me mommy, all-knowingness. Hi, Mom, I say in my most upbeat voice. You look good. Do I, dear? She smiles, but the way her black eyes dart warily tells me she knows better than to believe what I say. My mother is too smart. Her emotions shift like quicksilver through her intelligence, weighed, measured, and packaged to emerge in what she thinks is an appropriate response. Thank you, dear. That's very sweet of you. It feels so good to be here again, I say too loudly, flopping onto the Danish modern couch, its brown striped fabric scratchy against my sweaty skin. The wooden legs scrape on the terrazzo floor. It's not as hot as it was in September. You know, dear, my mother sighs. Your energy tires me out. I think I'd like to go to bed again. Lydia and I help her walk into the bedroom, Lydia giving me knowing glances over my mother's bowed head, glances that say, you see how bad she is? I feel the bones of my mother's back as I cradle her. Her arms are deceptively fleshy, so I hadn't noticed how much weight she's lost. I help her out of her dress and take off her underwear while Lydia tidies the room. 
and am shocked anew by the wide purple zipper of stitches down my mother's belly, from underneath her small breast to the thinning hair of her pubis. The tumor has grown back. Her stomach is distended to the size of a five-month pregnancy. She raises her arms like a dutiful child, and I slip her pink gingham nighty over her illness. I am so tired, she says, lying back in her narrow bed against the pillows Lydia has plumped. I've been waiting out there in the living room for two hours for you. I'm sorry, I say, old anger and guilt building. I couldn't get the plane to fly any faster. I'm aware of that, dear. She sighs and closes her eyes. Here I am. Lydia has gone back across the street with Joey. Joey the junkie is in his late 30s but still lives with his mother Estella in a house directly opposite my mother's. I noticed as soon as I got into the car at the airport that Joey has put on 20 pounds since September, a good sign. He's staying off the stuff. That's what Lydia told me during one call, but I didn't believe her even though I said, that's great, Lydia, ojala, he stays off. Ojala, she answered solemnly and then giggled as if to nullify her hope. Lydia, who is 50 but can look and act like a teenager, comes to stay at Estella's on the day she is looking after my mother. I think Lydia saw the job as an opportunity to keep tabs on Joey, to stop him from scoring and make sure he doesn't land back in jail for dealing. So here I am again. I spent the month of September caring for my mother in the hospital in San Juan. I returned to New York once I'd settled her back in the house on Calle Maruja with a full-time nurse and with Lydia to do the housework and to check on the nurse. Estella had said, tapping the sagging skin below her left eye, you can never trust an outsider to do the job. You must get someone you know to oversee. I don't think Estella meant Lydia. The last person Estella wants in her house is this woman she claims wants my baby Joey, wants him to marry her. She's too old for him. Estella doesn't seem to realize that Lydia is the best thing that ever happened to her handsome, weak, skaghead son. It was Joey who recommended Lydia to me, which made me have grave doubts about her. But then I met her. I immediately liked this tiny, fit woman with her carrot hair tied in a high ponytail. Her face was ruddy and freckled, suggesting that her hair might actually have been red once. Her teeth were false, so they were as white as a youngster's, and except for her hair lip, her face was fine-featured and cute. She was born in Brooklyn and came to PR as a teenager when her mother was dying. My heart was broken, she confided to me at our first meeting. You know what I mean. I stayed here because, in, because, I stayed here because in PR, I felt like I was with me mommy. It's the worst thing to have your mommy die. She had looked at me with such compassion that I couldn't tell Lydia that I didn't think it would be the same for me, that I was certain it wouldn't. How could I tell her I was afraid I'd be dry-eyed at my mother's funeral? Today, just before Lydia left with Joey, she gave me a big hug. I'm your mommy now, Sarah. I'll take care of you like a mommy through this. I'll come every day to take care of you, she whispered in Spanish into my ear, even though my mother's air conditioning was on the highest setting and her door was closed. I turn on the television and its blare melds into the rising clamor of early evening in the afternoon. Radios blasting, pots and pans clanging, cocks crowing off schedule, and children calling. There are no real windows in this neighborhood, only louvers that can be cranked open and shut to the outside air. In my mother's bedroom, sheets of thin plastic cover the windows at night to keep the air conditioning in. We live in each other's homes in Levittown Lakes. On this evening in November, the proximity of our lives makes me feel less lonely as I flip the channels and settle on the classic movie station. The sun streams deep gold through the open front door and across the chalky, cracked terrazzo floor, reaching the dark teal blue chair that I, we've had since we lived on Long Island. My parents moved down here 20 years ago to go to, reti to retire. After six months, my father couldn't stand the idleness. Or maybe it was the constant company of my mother that weighed on him. So he went back to work, and a little later, so did she. My father died 12 years ago. My mother is going to die here, too, very soon. Though right now, she's sleeping. How many times and how many different homes I've waited while my mother slept, taking her long, stuporous naps through the afternoons. Today, it's different. I am here waiting for her to die. 
We have lived in so many places, my mother and I, my father too, but he was rarely around, was either on the road or out late working, coming home soon. My mother and I, following my father from job to job, settled for a year here or two years there. Five years was our longest in California, Washington State, Chicago, Ohio, Arkansas, Vermont, and Long Island. And in those locales, we changed apartments on an average of three times per town. Whenever the rent was raised above $35 a month, we had to pack up our belongings and move to a cheaper neighborhood. Here we are again, she and I, alone together in Levittown Lakes. This place cost her $100 a month in mortgage payments, comparable, I'd say, to what we paid in the 1950s. I have always been my mother's best companion, while she has too often been my enemy. I wonder if she knows how much and how vividly I hate her. I wonder if she knows that I haven't had a child because I don't want another human to hate me as much as I hated her. I dare myself to have these thoughts even though she is in the next room dying. And then I begin to cry. It is a deep, gut-wrenching weeping that I don't understand. But I do know that it has to do with her dying in the next room and my sitting out here alone in November in my shorts and tanks top watching an old black and white movie on television while other people's vibrant lives go on just outside our louvered windows. Now I'm going to skip day two, but the thing that you, uh, the only thing you need to know in day two is that this woman actually mercifully has a very nice husband. And his name is Roberto, and he's an exile from Argentina. He's also a shrink, a, a psychoanalyst, which is very convenient in the story. Um, and uh, he, he plays a, a minor but comforting part in, in the story as it goes along. But I just want you to know, um, to know that there's some relief here, and also to know that uh, his name comes up for just a moment in the story, so I want you to know who he is. When my father died 12 years ago, my mother asked me to sleep that first night with her on my father's side of the bed. Whatever my mother asked, I always did without question. Contemplate this. Even though the double bed was really two twins pushed together, I never considered pulling them apart. I lay down on the spongy, sagging mattress, sinking into the indentation made by his body over the years, smelled his odor on the sheets that had not been changed, and was certain I could feel his warmth in them. Terrified, I clutched the edge of the bed all night, keeping myself out of my mother's reach. She lies in that same room today on a narrow, single bed. My father's half has long since been discarded. We have helped her undress, Lydia and I, eased her down until her head touched the pillow, and together witnessed how she immediately fell asleep. I sit watch over my mother on a floral pattern club chair, pulled close to her bed, with my bare legs folded up into what children call Indian style. The walls of this small square cinder block room have been painted a pale peach by my mother, creating a rosy aura as the afternoon wanes. In addition to the bed and club chair, there was a small table with a lamp to my left. Behind it, a window looks out onto the house next door, where Inez and Jorge Garcia live with their daughters. <clears throat> Inez and Jorge are born-again Christians. She is a teacher at the church school, and he is a social worker in the welfare department. Their fervent religiosity doesn't seem to get in the way of my mother's love for their firstborn daughter, Lourdes, who is four years old and who, until my mother became too weak, came, became regularly for afternoon visits. It's clear that precocious, dimpled, and slightly spoiled Lourdes is the substitute for the grandchild my, my mother will never have. On my mother's bedside table is a small photograph of Lourdes framed in silver. A teak bureau stands to the right of the other floor-to-ceiling jealousy window on the far wall. I've removed the plastic covers from both windows. In the backyard, the tree planted in memory of my father by Roberto and the old man from across the street, Eugenio Castro, has grown taller than the house by many feet. It shades my mother's window and rustles in the merciful breeze that always picks up off the ocean in late afternoon here in Levittown Lakes. I think, Daddy is watching over us. He'll take care of us. He'll help us find our way through this last part. I think this, knowing full well that taking care of us was not his strong point. 
The beach is a mile and a half from the house, and I long to be on its crescent spit of land where the wind blows so hard that your hair is whipped around your head and the sand sprays up and coats your wet body after you emerge from your swim, to stand with your back to the sea looking out across the choppy waters of the bay to the golden skyline of old San Juan. It is my mother's favorite beach. And before she got sick, she used, she used to go each day to swim, side stroke, up and down the shoreline for half an hour. I can see her head in her white bathing cap, her eyes half closed and essentially blind without her thick glasses, cutting through the undulating turquoise water. After her swim, she told me she liked to sit on the beach for a while and watch the children playing, or just look up at the sky, the most beautiful sky in the world, she said. In all the places we've ever lived, I've never seen such marvelous cloud formations. I can imagine how she walked up from the water, her body angled forward against the wind and the slope of the beach. When she reached her towel, she would have bent to get her glasses from inside her shoe. That's where she always left them, as far back as I can remember. And that's where I leave mine as well. I can see the water beating on her oily skin, how the tips of her hair would be wet when she pulled off her cap, how she wiped her arms first and then her legs before wrapping the towel around her shoulders to protect them from the sun. She would have looked longingly at the small children, and she will tell me in great loving detail when we next talk on the telephone how sweet and beautiful they were, always adding, but of course none of them was as lovely as Lourdes. When I was seven, we vacationed for a week on the coast of Maine, my mother, father, and I. We rented a little cabin under white pine trees within walking distance of the long, flat beach. For days, I played happily at the edge of the water, running in and out, racing the waves. My mother kept saying, you should go out beyond the waves where it's calm. You don't have to be afraid. But I said, no, I'd rather stay there playing in the surf. My mother grew impatient on the third day. Emerging from the water, she stood over me, tall and slender in her red and white seersucker bathing suit, her dark, springy, backlit curls glistening with droplets. You know how to swim. You're strong enough. You simply have to be brave for a moment as you pass through. The next day, she was angry. I saw it in her face and the menacing look in her eyes. I was questioning her authority. She grabbed me around the waist and dragged me into the icy water. The grip of her arm against my skin was unrelenting, and her fingers bit into my bare midriff as my bony hip thudded against her own. The water rushed up around us, engulfing our bodies, and I heard the screams of children just before a wave crashed down on us in a whirlwind of heavy, pounding water filled with thick, swirling sand. It pushed us down and around until we emerged into the calm on the other side, the calm she had promised. The sun was too bright. My eyes stung as she turned me onto my back and told me to breathe deeply. Her hand remained under me on the narrow of my back as we lay in the swelling waters. My terror then was greater than what we'd been underwater. I couldn't look at her, didn't want her touching me, didn't trust that hand underneath my spine. She could drown me out here and who would know? I had to get away from her. I flipped over onto my stomach and began to swim toward shore, flailing my arms and legs, gasping for air. She kept up with me. Good girl, she was saying. I swam faster, my fear of her giving me strength. She came up on my left side, and I thought, if she grabs me, I'll bite her. When a wave took me, and I rose on the top of it, and for a moment, I was as free as a fish, slipping across the water, hanging suspended, looking down onto the beach filled with laughing, playing people, and my mother was nowhere near. The wave was kind to me and deposited my skinny body on a bed of rolling foam, sweeping me safely back to shore. My mother sleeps. She is curled on her side with her hands pressed in prayer under her cheek. Dark twists of hair cling to her sweaty temple. She could be 21 years old the way the wrinkles have fallen from her peaceful face. My mother has always slept as an escape long hibernations from which she wasn't easily roused. The five-hour naps frightened and disgusted me as a child. I would want her to wake and make me dinner, and at the same time, I wished she would sleep forever so I could go alone into the evening and next day and on and on in my solitariness, entertaining myself with the stories I made up. Soon, I will have my old wish. Soon, she will never wake.